Today's facilitation team are Phoebe Tikal, Indra Adnan, and Divya Siddharth. So Divya's work, just to introduce, uh, Divya's work uh, covers a broad range of research and applications in the space of democratized technology, data collaboration, and online and offline participative governance structure. Is it on mute again? I'm not sure what's happening. <laughs> I'm going to do the rest like this, so you know that I'm not pressing mute. Did you hear anything of Divya's, the introduction of Divya? First sentence. The first sentence, yeah. Oh, wowzer. This is a real glitchy moment, isn't it? Interesting. Okay, I'm we'll just... talk about the panel. Yeah, I'll try and keep an eye on, on here, but thank you for highlighting that. Okay, so I'll try again. Uh, Divya's work covers a broad range of research and applications in the space of democratized technology, data collection, and online and offline participative governance structures. Her current research focus, make sure I don't unmute, but I move my mouse here. Her current research focus is around promoting and preserving the digital commons, building the technology and policy infrastructure for data coalitions and devising frameworks for collectively focused rather than centrally concentrated AI. She is a researcher with Radical Exchange Foundation and the Digital Civil Society Lab, an associate political econo economist and social technologist at Microsoft's office of the CTO. Next up, we have Indra Adnan is the co-initiator for, for Alternative UK, a political platform that has asked the questions of asked the question, if politics is broken, what's the alternative? The Alternative now produces a daily blog, works with new system builders, and develops Cosmo Local citizen action networks on the ground. Indra is concurrently a psycho psychosocial therapist, consultant in soft power, and author of a new book coming out in May called The Politics of Waking Up. And I would say if there's any links you would like to pop in the, in the chat there to highlight your work, then please do drop them in. It would be really interesting for the audience, I think, to see those links. Our facilitator today is Phoebe Tickell. Phoebe is an ecologist and innovator, applying the principles of biology and ecology to social systems. Over the last 10 years, she has worked as a consultant and advisor in distributed governance, ecology, arts, experiential futures, narrative, organizational design, and the imagination. Phoebe recently finished work at the Digital Fund at the National Lottery Community Fund and cares a lot about ethical public interest technology. She is working now on Moral Imaginations, a design lab and partnership community for experiential collective imagination practices, building the case with others for civic imagining towards moral futures. What a group of people, what a fantastic panel. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Phoebe to kick us off for this, this morning's discussion. Phoebe. Thank you, Richard. And hi, everyone. Really great to see all your faces. Uh, nice to see many um, fellow imaginary, imagination kind of rebels and activists. Um, and it's it's really exciting to be able to spend the next kind of 50 minutes with, with such an incredible group of people talking about something that maybe is a bit more hidden in terms of our movements, our digital platforms, and that kind of invisible infrastructure that actually you know, has a really big impact on the kind of change and how we organize. Um, before I speak a bit more, I just thought we could ask all of you to put into the chat, what are the questions that you're arriving to this panel with? So what, what's brought you to this particular panel? Um, maybe one or two kind of really uh, knotty questions that you're asking in your movements and your organizations when it comes to how do we use technology best um, for building community and relationships? Um, so I'll just let, I'll give you a little moment to do that. Um, but just before I, I kind of hand over to Indra and Divya, um, who maybe you, the two of you can keep an eye on the chat because I'm awful at multitasking. So I'm just gonna speak and not try and read and speak at the same time. Um, but not many people talk about how the really basic but important thing that about 20 or 30 years ago, community building was was simply a human to human, you know, maybe maybe phone phone mediated um, experience and action, but now, 
you know, the, the huge potential, but also the huge risk of technology and of the internet has opened up this potential for sort of global, you know, global organizing and our movements like Transition Towns, like Extinction Rebellion, like Black Lives Matter, those movements don't exist anymore just offline in terms of gathering together as bodies in the real world. They also exist very much online in different forums, you know, ways to actually build community and, and organize things to happen in the real world um, using collective decision making tools, participatory budgeting tools, ways of communicating in the Hong Kong protests, we saw how uh, Signal and Telegram was used on kind of massive scale. So Telegram is a kind of uh, secure messaging app and it was used using the poll function for the kind of hundreds of, maybe I think it was hundreds of thousands, I don't wanna misquote, but a lot large groups of people to organize very, very quickly um, using these kind of messaging apps. So the, the landscape of how we organize and how we do social change has just completely shifted. And there are questions within that in terms of who owns the platforms and who owns the data and who and how secure those platforms are that it's worrying um, because the people who are doing the organizing don't necessarily have that you know the time and capacity to to be diving really deeply into those ethical questions when actually a lot of this organizing is very urgent so this panel and this next kind of 50 minutes is about us trying to you know dive into some of those questions and try trying to open up the conversation in the space between the grassroots and the community side of things and then the more kind of technical digital ethical uh data governance sort sort of kind of knotty questions um and and then yeah trying to kind of build a bit of a bridge between those so with that i'm just going to pass to uh indra and and then to divya and i'm just going to ask the question kind of what are you what are the questions kind of on that topic that you're arriving with and and yeah how where do we start thanks phoebe um and hello everybody and i feel like phoebe very excited about this audience and how uh, we might be able to frame the important questions going into the future at this time so just by way of explanation um we started the Alternative UK platform um, just at the moment where Brexit was happening. In fact, we were triggered into starting this by the death of Joe Cox, when we were asking ourselves, um, how could it come to this? You know, so how, how could it be that we have become so divided that uh, at the polar extremes of the kinds of divisions that our politics has been um, really curating for us, people are prepared uh, in moments of um, high anxiety to kill each other. And of course, going back historically, that you might say that's always been the history of politics, division um, and at the extremes, um, re you know, reactions that are really beyond, beyond human understanding. So the question was always for us, um, where do the people lie uh, you know, in a new politics? Where is our power? How do we get to say what happens next? And the query, you know, the inquiry has led us to come to three conclusions. First of all, that we've already been in a revolution of technology and connectivity for about 20 years. And for us to imagine that we're not already taking part in a technological reality is somehow to ignore what has been happening um, with some people really controlling the strings, if you like, for over 20 years now. So the question is as much, how do we extricate ourselves from our technological reality as how do we use technology to help us find more power? And right in the bigger question of democracy, we had to ask, what is missing? Where is the human being at the heart of our politics? And, and what is really missing from the relationships that we're able to make with each other? And after a couple of years, really, of looking at it very closely, through what we can already observe is happening, we've come to the conclusion that what is missing at the heart of our politics is the, is the complex human being able to make a connection with other complex human beings, right? So this is why we believe that citizens action networks or community agent networks, 
everything that Transition's been doing for the past 10, 15 years is in a sense the answer to our question of where does the human being lie? But how does the technology hold that, um, that conclusion that we've come to? In our experience, um, technology is very good at connecting people, but not necessarily very good at helping them move into complex relationships. So that's really, in a sense, where we've come to. We've, and we are playing around with many different kinds of platforms. You know, we have our own Lumio groups, which are discussion groups. Um, we do Twitter, we take part in Facebook. These are the ways that we're all already connecting. But our question is, how do we go beyond that? What is the next level? And then when we do find a place to really deeply connect on technology, who owns that data, as Phoebe said? It's very important, we feel, in this moment of people taking back their own power, that they should be able to own their investment in the future. So that's kind of uh, my starting point. Thank you, Indra. Um, passing to Divya. Yeah, well, thanks so much and, and really grateful to be in this space. This community is a little bit new to me uh, and, and thank you for being so welcoming and having me as a part of this conversation. Also really excited about all the questions in the chat um, and, and so much good discussion to be have had here and, and thanks to Indra for setting that up. I think I'll, I'll go pretty briefly because I, I know we want to have time to get to those questions. Um, in terms of, you know, what it looks like to have community-based helpful community-centered, I think, technology, it's it's a pretty wide chasm, I think we can all agree, between the technological universe we are under currently and that, you know, goal that we are moving towards. And so, you know, part of the work is how do we get there? How do we bridge that gap? And I think part of it is, well, along the way, how do we use technology to the extent that we can to fulfill those community-centered goals and then have the ability also to understand where a lot of that technology is coming from and you know work against it when it needs to be done in that way i think a lot of my work is particularly around um, as mentioned earlier decentralized governance practices participative practices online um, i also did a lot of work in india for a while on ethnography of movement organizers and how they use technology to sort of upend the status quo currently and i think there's a really significant interaction in that sense between the platforms that we have available to us, the education that we have to use those platforms, um, you know, basic kind of threat modeling in a sense in terms of how a lot of these platforms interact with each other, how we can find alternatives, um, build alternatives if necessary. Um, and, you know, a, a big piece of how the government sees technology as well and how we can advocate for different types of regulation and ownership in that Space. Um, to me, I think one of the more actionable things that can be done, I saw some, some questions in the chat itself about, um, you know, open source alternatives to platforms or what are the best platforms to use. And I think that is a, is a really big starting point, right? How do we get off of these hyper monopolies that we're currently all in many different ways beholden to um, that are constructing these data graphs of us at a higher level? And part of that looks like finding open source alternatives. Um, I think a lot of that also can look like, as, as other folks mentioned in the chat, um, you know, building offline plus online structures that allow for movements to be really rooted in the present um, and in the offline space, but also using these online areas as a tool. Um, and alternately, Alternately, alternatively, I meant to say, um, you know, we do see that, okay, incredible movements have been organized online, right? We, we hear about nations spanning movements that needed online spaces to succeed. And I think that is an incredible gift that we have, but a lot of those online spaces were not set up for that. In fact, those movements had to subvert the logic of the spaces that they used to create this good outcome from them. They, they were opposite of the alignment um, of, you know, between those movements and those spaces. And so, you know, as we use spaces for these positive ends, I think, again, we really have to, to figure out uh, how we can either find alternatives or make sure that we're really cognizant of what's happening on these platforms and using them to the extent that we have to, but not, you know, way more than that, essentially. And so, um, 
I think developing alternatives is, is the best thing to do here. I have a bunch of open source tools that I really love that I'll, I'll share in the chat later. Um, I think one of my favorite examples of this type of ecosystem working at scale is the civic kind of hacking culture in Taiwan, where it's really a combination of, you know, open source participative tools. One of my favorites is called Polis. I saw someone earlier asked, how do we have a thousand plus people express opinions in a space? I think Polis is a really excellent way to do that. Um, they also use a combination of online tools plus offline facilitation because there are folks who can't make it to uh, online spaces in various capacities. So there has to be that intersection between online and offline. And I think the last piece is, well, they also have universal broadband as part of you know, the legislation of the land, which uh, I'm in New York now, and we don't even have that in this dense urban city in, in the US, right? And so I think it's a combination of online spaces, offline facilitation, and that material commitment to bringing people into the online that we can't necessarily do ourselves, but community-based alternatives are there. And so with that, uh, I will stop my soliloquy and, and hope we can have a discussion. Wonderful, um, Divya. I'll just kind of pick up where you left off, and and I've put the questions that have come in into a Google Doc and done a bit of um, sense making and divided them into some areas. If the two of you want to have a look and and just get a sense of what the the group is asking, but um, I can just speak from the experience of uh, being part of a digital self organizing collective called Inspiral, which some people may have will have heard of, some some of you not. Um, I can put links into the chat, but we are a global collective and network of activists and social entrepreneurs that use uh, digital tools to basically be like a decentralized organization. So we make decisions together, we budget um, like a company, we're kind of like a distributed uh, organization. So we make decisions around budgeting together. We, we use um, a tool called CoBudget. Um, I'm just putting these all in because it seems like people are really, folks are really looking for those tools that they can use that are open source and ethical. Um, and we use something called Lumio.org, um, which we built, called, which is a kind of open source, um, ethical, uh, decentralized decision-making tool. And um, what we found was that, you know, there are some things that these digital tools allow you to do that, uh, that you can't do in person. And actually it can be very democratic, like what these digital tools allow, for example, in decision makings, you know, people who may usually not feel as confident to speak up in a room of people and, and you know, often you have the loudest voices, suddenly you get these tools that actually open up ways of behaving that aren't possible before. So often we do focus on what digital tools um, kind of stop us, you know, that limit us from doing in terms of relationship building. And as a collective, we meet, we meet twice a year to do that kind of five day deep dive retreat where we kind of spend five days together, no phones, you know, out in the countryside and have that deep relationship building that is just not possible to do over Zoom. And we think of that as the kind of heartbeat of our collective because it's sort of like a heartbeat you know the connection goes up and then over six months it starts to go down and you know conflicts and uh, grievances and things may start to build up and then you meet again and you know so that is a really important thing I think to remember that you can't solely um, rely on the kind of digital tools for organizing um, and just the other thing I thought would be interesting to mention um, this platform don't go back to normal that um, I built together with somebody called Stephen Reed, who started the Psychedelic Society uh, in the UK. He's he's a Tottenesian and quite involved, I think, in things in Totnes. Um, so we built this platform that basically is a it's a very simple um, sort of bank of alternative tools that are decentralized, open source, and ethical that give an alternative to every. We're trying to cover every single base, so messaging, uh, video calling, you know, banking. We're kind of trying to make a, a database of kind of ethical alternatives. So that's uh, another thing that I'll just share. Um, but the the problem we've been finding, and I think many people in the kind of digital ethical digital um, movement are finding it, that many of these platforms are just not as well developed as the you know the alternatives like Zoom. So. Right now we're using Zoom. It's a private monopoly company. It's, you know, it's, a, it's owned by a corporation. The data belongs to them. Um, but at the same time, the alternatives like Jitsi, which is one of the uh, ethical open source alternatives that you'll find on that list, you know, it's glitchy and it has problems and it doesn't have the same you know, user 
um, experience like the, the same and it hasn't had the same investment. So I think I just wanted to kind of put that into the conversation, Indra and Divya, like what can we do as movements and, and what do we do when again and again, you know, I, I hear people say, oh, I'm going to build a new Facebook or like, I know what I'm going to do. Like we should build in, you know, an alternative to Zoom. And it's like, well, actually we just need one. We really only just need one alternative that is truly ethical, truly owned, you know, by many. Um, so yeah, what, what do you think about that? And, and what would that look like? Do you think to have an ethical stack that has enough investment to be uh, competitive with these other tools that we're using? Should I go? Yeah, well, well, yes, I think that is the, that's the great question and the great goal in, in a sense, you've, you've, you've described it well, but um, moving towards that goal, uh, and, and I confess that I've been working with a small group of people trying to think of what is a, a global virtual party, for example. How do, how do we move everybody into conversation about their own power and how it's being expressed uh, all over the world? And we've been, do, we've been having that conversation for a year just as a conversation. So the one thing I wanted to really land here is that as we start to talk about tech, we're also sort of waking up to how controlled we have been over the years. You know, it's shocking and surprising that once you start to ask the question of where does my power lie, you start to see how you have been manipulated by past tech all this time. And when, I, when I'm referring to tech, I think there's somebody in the question box asking, you know, what, what do you mean by tech anyway? But let's think about the role of the media as a tech that has been shaping our minds and our behavior for, well, all of us for as long as we've been alive. There's nobody here who hasn't been at the receiving end of, of a media's um, commitment to shaping the way you think. And in the process of that, they have shaped um, a society that is really addicted to consumerism, which is the very thing that helps keep this growth economy going, which, uh, and, and you can see the knock-on effect. So as we're, asking the questions around tech, we're also waking up to the tech that we're already part of and trying to free ourselves from that, right? So this is a very steep learning curve that we're on. Um, during this moment of COVID, um, a lot of people have been forced, if you like, into a new tech reality because they're doing exactly what you've been describing, uh, relying much more on WhatsApp or Facebook to communicate with people moving into these virtual spaces like Zoom. Um, to, to my mind, this has been a very valuable thing to experience because in fact, Zoom has delivered a different kind of virtual intimacy between people. It's exhausting, there's no doubt about it, but one of the reasons it's exhausting is because really you're in these really heavy, deep conversations with people that actually were living next door to you all this time, you never had that conversation before. So we're in an incredibly steep curve right now of asking the question of which tech is good and which tech is not good. But each one of us, I feel that the thing that is very, very important is that each one of us owns our own journey with the tech and to feel comfortable at every stage with what you're playing with and to be aware that this is not to do with being naive about anything. It's about us all waking up collectively to our lack of power that we've had until now. Um, I, I love the way you, you put that last part, and I think um, it goes really well with the discussion happening in the chat in terms of, you know, why are these spaces that we all rely on that we don't have alternatives to privately controlled and under commercial incentives, right? I think that's the major question here, and, and that sort of brings this framing of what what is digital public infrastructure and what could that look like, I think, to the table, and this is something that I've been thinking about a lot because I think the more we have these conversations, as, as Phoebe said, we want to build alternatives. We don't have the resources to fund Facebook as a group. We simply don't. We, you know, so so what does it look like to build alternatives and where are those resources? And how do we, you know, create public interest mandated platforms given the reality of the ecosystem here? I think that's a huge question. Um, my answer has a few parts. I think part of it is, okay, we do want to empower communities to build alternatives. I think this is most helpful when communities are able to build on top of existing platforms 
to, you know, use them for their own purposes and, and the community built part is really an extension of what the platform can do rather than trying to build a platform from scratch. So then that begs the question, well, if they're still having to use the platform, right, how does this kind of save, save us or solve this problem? And I think there is going to be a role here for regulation and for, for partnership with um, public sector entities, because at the end of the day, the, the public infrastructure that we live under is not entirely community based at this point, and that's for a good reason. It's because, you know, pub the public sector exists as a space that we are trying to pool our resources so we can build out the other types of infrastructure, whether we need, whether that's the justice system or roads. And I think we can all agree that our public infrastructure outside of the digital space could use a ton of advocacy and a lot of change as well. And in fact, a lot of movement organizing is around that. But I think it is really worth putting organizing effort um, behind advocating for digital public infrastructure. And, and that can look a couple of different ways. One could be you know, advocating for a public interest mandate for the kinds of major platforms that we have to live under. And I think you know we can all name at least ten of these platforms off the top of our heads. So so can lawmakers. You know it's not unreasonable to have accountable, audited, public interest mandated platforms. A second is requiring interoperability. Um, there's a lot of technical work recently in terms of well, what would it look like for me to really easily be able to port my data from Zoom to Jitsi or from Facebook to another alternative? And that suddenly brings so much more power into our hands rather than into the hands of those platforms simply by having a technical fix on interoperability. And that doesn't solve any of the policy questions, but could really go a long way into building out a more public version of this infrastructure. Um, you know, we've always had parks alongside private spaces. We've we've often had at least public media alongside private media. We've tried to have open knowledge like libraries alongside other private stores of knowledge, even bookstores. And so it it is true that we deserve and, and it makes sense to have digital public infrastructure uh, on the side of a private infrastructure. I just saw a question that says, you know, let's not forget that the majority of, of the population doesn't have much of infrastructure at all. If we want inclusiveness, should we start there? I think absolutely. Um, and, you know, a lot of this work is also around how do we build out that type of inclusive infrastructure while empowering people in their own regions to build context specific infrastructure. And I think some of that may look more like supporting and funding than by assuming that we uh, in, in our spaces know the context well enough to build infrastructure that should work across the entire world, particularly on the public side, right, particularly with a public interest mandate. So I, I absolutely agree that uh, it's a major problem that the majority of the population doesn't have access to to many kinds of infrastructure that I think, you know, universal well being would require, but uh, I think empowering different regions to to build context specific infrastructure is sort of one of the major things we can do here and using any advocacy we can have with larger international organizations to sort of to make that happen. Um, so, you know, those are some of my my current thoughts and, and would love more thoughts and reactions on what it could really look like to build out digital public infrastructure, what the steps we can take are, um, what kinds of infrastructure we should prioritize. There's the difference between kind of prioritizing public protocols, whether that's interoperability, right? Better identity standards. So you own your identity as you go around the web and that makes it harder to track. Or should we be prioritizing public platforms, which is, you know, we want to build out public alternatives to these specific platforms. And I think there are a ton of open questions in the space, but it's a good direction to go in terms of, you know, getting the digital ecosystem that, that we need and, and should have as a community. I, I, it's, yeah, there's just so much that um, we could go into. I, I thought maybe just before we go into breakouts to, um, you know, get, get some questions going in some smaller groups, you know, why don't we just take a moment to imagine what that could look like? What could it look like to have an e a digital in ecosystem infrastructure that truly belongs to the people, but is actively maintained and taken care of and you know innovated by a group i mean as a as a world we don't seem to have have got got it down on how to do that kind of wikipedia like you know we've got wikipedia it's like that is co-created that's collective intelligence it's it's a very good example but it's you know it's stewarded by a foundation and and you know there's just not that many examples of that apart from 
Wikipedia, but what would what would like a Facebook look like that that is modeled on a Wikipedia? How, yeah, can we do a bit of um, imagining before we go into the breakouts and then um, we can hear what other people have been thinking? Indra. Uh, yes, <laughs> just, I'm, when I'm looking at the sea of faces, I forget that you might be talking to me. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been consciously imagining this for, as I say, for about a year. And the interesting thing is, um, what is it that people would want from this kind of a system? You know, so what we've discovered is, is that some people want um, a direct sense of agency. In other words, they're looking for a way to express themselves and have a say in something. So it's almost like a, a new democratic structure that they're looking for. Um, and if you, if you remember that today as citizens, only 2% of people are members of political parties. These are the people who in a sense are responsible for the political discourse that we're all following. And we only get a vote every five years. So if you think about how little participation is occurring now, then of course people want much more of this direct participation. But on what terms? You know, simply voting. Yesterday, in fact, there was a new party launched. It was called the Autonomous Party. And the Autonomous Party, I can't tell you how many parties have been launched since Brexit. It was 90 in the first year, right? 90 new parties launched in the first year after Brexit. People wanting to have a say, wanting to have more direct. But in this, in this Autonomous Party, what it was offering was something called pure technological you know, pure technology participation from all over the world. That's not what we stand for, because we, we know that in the sense you already have that, that's what Facebook is. You can make your feelings known. And to many people, Facebook is already a kind of global governance system. We all get to say what we think and we self-organize into our groups. And in a way it's already there. The much bigger question is where does genuine deliberation happen? Where do people have the space and time to really discuss what they think about something, which is the, the kind of um, operation that uh, a citizens assembly, for example, really holds that possibility? How would that be held online? So that, that to me is, is very important. Polis, um, I, I'm sure Divya and I could have quite a long discussion around Polis. I think it goes some of the way there. But I think the places where it really works is where a society is already bought into this idea that we have a shared responsibility. I wouldn't say that we really have that in the UK yet. So there are so many almost platforms that are appearing now. And then the other thing that is really being asked for is that people want to be in a global conversation with others. I think this is the most important part of what people are demanding because it's happening everywhere. You can see it everywhere just recently the opening of something like Clubhouse is literally just conversation, 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 people being able to hear their own voices, hear other people's voices. What exactly is the demand? What is it that people most want from this political, from this, sorry, um, technological platform that we are describing and dreaming of right now? Thanks, Indra. Divya, I'd love to um, just jump into your imagination space with all your incredible, you know, work and background in in really getting into the concrete, um, yeah, of the of the digital alternatives. Like, what what could that realistically look like? And and also maybe we want to integrate a little bit of the discussion in the chat where you know people are rightly saying there are already a number of alternatives. The problem is actually this you know, how do we get users over there, especially when you need this massive kind of investment, like platforms like Uber, you know, handing out 20 pound vouchers to anyone who uses their service. It's like, you know, it's it, they've got very smart um, and, and kind of very backed ways of getting everybody onto those platforms. Yeah, I, I was going to say when you, when you mentioned that, I'd love to jump into the imagination of everyone on this call and, and don't want to monopolize imagination space. But, um, you know, briefly, I think these are all absolutely the right questions and, and unfortunately I'm not sure we will certainly answer them here but my point of view is you know in being really cognizant of the potential harms that technology is bringing to our lives we shouldn't lose the imagination possibilities of what we could potentially build using technology and, and as 
someone mentioned earlier on, what is technology? Well, the lines are really porous between what's technology and what isn't. I think, you know, systemic understanding is itself a technology, a really well-run group you can say is using some form of technology to make that happen, even if it's not a, a platform. And so I think there are some technologies that we can use to really augment those capabilities. And some of the ones we've mentioned are like that and some are not, and some are meant to be like that. And some are being used for that purpose, despite the fact that they're not, you know, intended to be like that. Um, and that's why coming back to what, what major partnerships could look like in terms of getting the investment we'd need to make other platforms viable, to make other spaces viable. Uh, I think there are two kind of options here and ideally they work concurrently. One is the larger public interest mandate and working with you know, foundations that have the capability to do investment and being so involved with that process that it's really accountable to what people's interests are uh, in terms of building that out. And I think advocating for transparency and audits and all of those things is part of that. But I think another is, well, technology has sort of made us think about how impact has to scale, how platforms are scalable, how they're most useful when they're used um, you know, by millions of people. And I think that's absolutely true and a lot of really incredible uh, you know, successes of technology come from that. But also we see that even with Polis, for example, the most useful instances to communities are the ones where they're pretty hyper local they're grounded in offline facilitation processes as well they're processes that happen over months as people know each other on the platform and off um, and so i think while we are advocating for a shift in what the ways the larger platforms function and larger online spaces function as we are also building up new technologies, whether that's interoperability, I think someone mentioned, you know, decentralized governance tech, all of that is coming up. And I think there's a lot of exciting work happening there. We also keep in mind that alternatives can be incubated and impactful at the community level, even if they don't reach the kind of scale immediately or ever that the tech has kind of told us is, is useful or is what determines success. So I think you know, all three of those things layered on top of each other is kind of my hopeful vision of the technological future. I think there was probably a time in my life where, you know, I was pretty jaded with the opportunities of technology everywhere. You'd see how great tech could be, but I wasn't really convinced. But I think, you know, seeing the ways that communities have successfully used technology, the way that people are yearning for this collective change in our, in our built environment and in our online environment really gives me the hope to say, Look, technology can be the boon that we've all heard it was at one point or another and maybe believed or didn't, but there's a lot of work to do. Um, and, and so I'm looking forward to doing that work uh, in these kinds of spaces. So, yeah, I would love to hear the bits of what you discussed in the chat. And then um, Divya, Indra and I, we've got basically like a minute each. Key points, takeaways, you know, let, let's try and make it kind of practical, perhaps, um, you know, what what are people, what, what next? Um, I can go briefly. I think the thing that I really loved that we talked about in, in our room was, you know, what are the concrete ways that technology is also building collective community that we couldn't do before that is a little bit outside of directly organizing or directly doing political action. I mean, Gary mentioned all of these ways in which, you know, technology has made certain experiences way better, how we've been able to kind of travel during the pandemic um, due to all of the different events and things like that. And, and really, how can we use technology to facilitate communication and collaboration across different types of, of interactions that we might want to have? And I think that really reminded me, like, you know, can we be very intentional about using this as a platform for connection? And, and the other thing we sort of spoke about is, um, what does it look like to adjust the technology we have to move against the social and political logic that is pretty unequal that we currently live under, right? That does have different types of systemic harms that clearly marginalizes certain communities that lifts up voices at the expense of others. Well, that is the reality of both our online and our offline worlds. But the best we can do with technology is try to build it so it counters those logics. And there are larger ways to do that as we've talked about digital public infrastructure, you know, community alternatives, the incredible list that CD and folks put together on uh, open source platforms, which I know I'll be dropping into chats for, for months. Um, but I think there's also 
small adjustments that can be made. We talked about, you know, a Zoom extension that shows how much people are speaking in every meeting. So it's not the case that the same kinds of people are always speaking and it's really transparent, uh, you know, who's doing the most talking and who's getting the most airtime and then people are collectively responsible for that or, you know, privacy extensions on, on browsers or, you know, small instances of decentralized government. So I think those sort of pieces um, on you know the large scale countering of this and the building of new spaces, which is crucial. And, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but also the smaller ways in which we can say, look, some parts of technology are still pretty fluid and, and they're under our control and we find those tools and layer them on top of the spaces we already have um, to start making those differences. So, so really grateful to, to Gary and Joe for that conversation and, and, and to everyone for engaging in this space um, so deeply. So my 30 second wrap up would be something like, um, uh, I, I feel that there's a willingness in this space to go the next step with technology. Um, and there seems to be some sort of collective strength in the level of questions that we're asking. Um, and I think that the, the practical step really is to, is to nominate you know, an experiment that everybody in this community, in this network would be willing to do together and to really give it our attention, our collective attention, and to make sure that we co-own it. So these are the values that already exist within this, this network. Um, but I think that if you do that, you defeat or you, you challenge this idea that someone else is doing this to you and someone else is waiting to scale this up for their own profit. Let's, let's defy that and collectively decide which experiment we're gonna to do together and give it our full attention and then, then we're creating something that can be shared globally. That's my sense. Brilliant. I'm going to pass. Thank you so much. I mean, big, firstly, just a big thank you. Maybe we can all just um, have a moment of like thanks for um, yeah, Divya, Indra, Bibi. <laughs> Yes, all of us, all of you for coming, all the brilliant chat and of course, um, brilliant Transition Towns Network for hosting this conversation. But yeah, let's let's stand up and let's take back, um, take back control of our platforms. Mm -hmm.